Welcome to another episode of the Magnus and Marcus podcast. I'm Steve Magnus, the uh, head coach of uh, the University of Houston cross country team and author of Science of Running. Joined by high perform- performance West philosopher and coach John Marcus. And today we have a special guest coming at you again from Eugene and the Olympic trials, the director of track and field and cross country at Georgetown, Mike Smith. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. So, with Mike, a guy who's been in the out of the NCAA system and now in the NCAA system, we kind of were talking off off uh, podcast a little bit. Wanted to talk about maybe the thought process behind coaching and maybe some of the constraints that the system kind of puts on us as coaches. Because me and you, you know, we're in the NCAA system of race all the time have to be ready at certain times. John, you've been there too, but you've... Uh, I've left. I've made the exit. Uh, Life's better on the other side, baby. <laughs> migrated to the, to the warmer weather of uh, not having to deal with yes. indoor, outdoor, cross-country. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm gone. I'm out. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm interested, Mike, like from your standpoint, we were talking a little bit about Maybe what kind of constraints do you see in the NCAA system that you don't see outside of it? Yeah, certainly that um, that's something that is constantly on my mind as a college coach. It's you know first thing is we're working with eighteen to twenty two year olds that are college students. So yeah. big thing is they've got class. Um, you know, and I'm, I coach at a place where you know it's demanding academically, and and so I mean already outside of a scheduling you know conflict, there's this massive life stress that's a part of it um next we race on fridays and saturdays (laughs) and then we travel on thursdays and saturdays or sundays and so you know all of a sudden you know a lot of weeks as a college coach it's monday morning and i'm working with a you know monday to wednesday to get something done or um you know at georgetown we're we're asking them to be good in october november February, March, April, May, June. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, each of those months, there's yeah. something in there. Yeah. And in one of those months, you know, where it's like, yeah, this is important. And yeah. it's impossible. You know, so. It is. And I think even just from a post-collegiate standpoint, you look at this year alone, like with World Indoors and the Olympics and Olympic Trials, you know, for these professionals, like to be at that world-class level, even just sequentially twice out of a, a year within you know, an eight month span, near impossible. Like a lot of people who are on fire, kicking ass indoors from a post feeder perspective, were nowhere to be found at these trials. Yeah. Like out in the first round of their event when they were picked to make the team or, you know, way off the bat being lapped or dropping out in a distance event. It's like, what happened? That person looked unbeatable in March and now they can't even get it together in June. And then now you ask developing young men and women who are trying to live a life of 18 to 20 year olds, just a normal college life, to then be in peak form, I think you said like six months out of the year, it's an, it's an impossible ask. I mean, and it's just asking the question of how can one, you know, create a system or a better system or within the confines of the system, create a pattern of training that actually deals with the reality of the organism that stands in front of you as a living, breathing human being. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you see the same thing, but it's also, it's not only we have to be in peak shape at these times, it's that people see, my college kids see other people running fast at all times. Yeah, someone. Someone, someone's always running fast. Yes. Right? And you have this other kid who maybe has beaten them before or has competed against them and they're like, okay, like this kid came out and set the world on fire in January, like... I should be able to do that. Right. And then they, you know, come off their cross country break, run their first indoor opener, which you're thinking is, you know, a rust buster. But in their head, they're thinking like, oh, this person ran sub eight for 3K or whatever. Like, I should be on this. Right. And if I'm not doing that, I'm behind, I'm behind in some ways. Yes. Something's wrong. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it is an impossible ask. Look at, um, you know, just for example, the, the two really proficient uh, distance women in cross country, the girl from Boise State and the gal from Notre Dame, on fire and cross, and then one looks on fire indoors, gets hurt, one, you know, wins the NCAA indoor titles, and then she gets hurt. Yeah. And it's like, they were 
clicking and it's not they have really intelligent coaches who know what they're doing they're right. awesome people right. and it's like they they get the game but yet still despite that intelligence on their coaches part and their training part they still get hurt because again just to be at that high level of proficient excellence at a national class you know capacity year round is legitimately impossible you know i think the other thing that it curtails is is innovation it's it's you know I don't know. One of the one of the my favorite things about coaching is talking to other coaches and and you know looking at the problem of you know the riddle of how do we make someone a great athlete and when you're you know bound by a calendar or bound by certain constraints, it, I think it, it really uh, really holds back innovation, which as coaches should be something that we're you know, constantly seeking. You know, it's, it's, it, it, we we lose the creativity of thought, we lose the creativity of process, and um, you know I think that's another another place that we suffer yeah okay. let me ask you this though you guys as nc coaches if you guys had your way how would how would it look like how would it look if you guys had your way if you guys could just say we're going to do xyz like in an ideal world we're asking questions but i know you guys have like kind of a framework in mind that is ideal to the not only you know um immediate development within season to season cycling but also long-term development of that athlete like if you could just blow up the system and you know, re re piece it together, oh, how man. would that look? I, I mean, just to start, I, I constantly feel like I've got someone standing in front of me where it's like, man, I just wish I had a year or two just to train you, yes, and not and not have to race all the time. And instead, I'm like, oh, well, I've got a couple of weeks to train you or a couple of months to train you, but I never feel like I just have this. Well, you lose that development time. Yeah. You know, if I get a post collegiate kid, I'm thinking, okay, like. For instance, okay, Natasha Rogers, right? right? I heard her, and we were thinking she's coming off two stress fractures in you know uh, August of last year, and we're thinking we have this much time to get ready for this time at this time. Nothing else matters except like getting ready for this time. If you don't do shit in terms of racing for months and months, like it doesn't matter. Like we need this development time. If I have that same kid with that same problem in college, it's Oh, crap like you know if she if she's good for instance right, yeah, like right. your head coach or your administrators are like oh where's this person where's this person oh, shit. like we got to get back like we got to get back through the conference cross country meet right. or we got to get back for the indoor this and this and this and you're just forcing it all the time mm -hmm. and in, in the like from my ex experience in college coaching it's like you're always on this short-term vision of like I have to get this athlete to perform at this level at this time and you're almost like you can't think long term enough to think like oh what's gonna happen in June right. you know mm -hmm. you try to but like the system like in order to do so you really have to be able to step back and be like hey wait a minute right. like what am I doing yeah. and we lose that developmental time where it's like this athlete just needs time to get there yeah yeah, to, to me, you know, you start thinking backwards instead of, you know, saying, hey, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to develop someone and when they're ready to race, they'll race. Instead, it's the race is on this on day. Yeah. <laughs> That's not changing. The race is on this day. Exactly. So now, you know, you start making decisions off of that. And, and yeah, I mean, so I think, John, with the question of what would I, you know, it, it, if it could be different, I... Yeah, what's you know, your utopia? <laughs> yeah. Right. Your would, utopian <laughs> collegiate, like, yeah, uh, landscape. Right, it's... it's uh, yeah, I mean, some, sometimes I think, you know, if just this one, if I could just, uh, you know, there was no indoor track, right? I could, I, you know, I could, hey, we train in the summer, we've got cross country, we train in the winter, we've got outdoor track. Yeah. Um, and every, I mean, I, I hear so many coaches saying, we don't emphasize indoor. We don't, ah, indoor, we don't, we don't emphasize indoor. You look at the freaking team list, February 15th, yeah, looks yeah. like someone, someone's <laughs> emphasizing someone's indoor. <laughs> yeah. When 36 guys in the country go sub four yeah. on the same day, Somebody's emphasizing indoor. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, on that, I've always, I've toyed around with the idea sometimes in my head of like, I'm like, because sprint coaches sometimes love indoors, stuff like that. I'm like, move indoors to where cross country is. Sure. I have indoors be like, you know, 800 down. Yeah. You know, yeah, right. sure. then just like, here you go. Here's something to do in the fall for you guys. Yeah. Like, we'll get, we'll have cross country. You guys have your indoor stuff. Right. Like then we'll go. Then we'll have this nice long break. Well, I think also too, like indoors is low hanging fruit. Yeah, you know, for a lot of people. Like when I was in the NCA system, 
I had some precocious talents who I was like, man, we just need to sit down and just redshirt you and just train you for six, seven months. And they were on board and they got with it. But I had to like pull teeth with my boss to convince him this was a good idea because I'm like, look, 10 points next year from this person for a win at the conference beat is more valuable than like three points this year. True. And it's just like, we just have to stack it accordingly. And like, well, you can't guarantee it, but you know, you sit them down and you say, this is the vision. This is going to help them get better. This is going to help us look better. And it's about that long-term developmental plan, which is so short, short side now in the college coaching game. But you see it. It's just, you got a lot of smart people trying to identify where are the weak points, where are the points people aren't, aren't emphasizing, and how do I capitalize on that low-hanging fruit? Because I think when you sit back and look really critically, low-hanging fruit is indoors and also women's distance running. Yeah. Because for a long time, people didn't coach women distance runners like women distance runners. They just said, we're going to copy and paste and adjust the paces for the men's workouts and give that to you. Yeah. And then that's going to be just how we sure. do it. But now you have people who really understand and you're seeing this like remarkable increase in the speeds of play of women's competitive indoor and outdoor middle distance and distance running at the collegiate level and at the post collegiate level. Right. Versus the men have kind of stayed static. Yeah. You know, like we know the upper limits there. And so that that is, you know, what is in my mind happening a lot is people are just really hopping on and trying to maximize the low hanging fruit that exists right now. Sure. And you're going to see it until we, we find the threshold. Yeah. And then and then we'll get to this recalibration, whereas this homeostasis where it's all good. Well, you know, It's all a back and forth. Like People yeah. are just looking like, you know, <laughs> where can I get mine? It's like, do I emphasize cross country? Do I go indoors? Do I go outdoors? And right now, like as you said, indoors is low-hanging fruit. As more people emphasize that, then they're going to see people burning and can't can't hang it. So they'll mm-hmm. be like, oh, like we'll switch to outdoors. Yeah. And I think it just goes to show you, like it's an unsustainable model. Well, it's a highly volatile model. Like, look yeah. at the men's 10,000 this year in the NCAA. Like, everyone fled that event because Cheswick is so dominant. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, man, we can't do it. And then all of a sudden, people realize he's a little dinged up. Yep. Yep. And last minute, some people, like, went back into the event yep. and said, oh, 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 let's run, a, let's, run a, let's run a 10K at conference now because we have a shot. We have a shot. You know, and people got greedy again. But when you looked at the Tifers list before the conference weekend, it was in years past like these weren't these highly competitive no. names that because like well we're going to try to load you or move this 10 guy into a steeplechase or yep. move you down into the five because it might be a sit and kick race and you know we can strategize but oh we can't beat him in a 10 okay. and they when he you know that dominant athlete might leave you know the NCAA everyone's going to flood that event because it's wide open and you see all these guys going right. at Stanford or Payne Jordan just run bonko times because we have a shot to win now but when the shot to win isn't there, people are just like, I'm out. Well, I think that gets to the point. Is the NCAA system is very reactive. Like, you're just, like, bouncing around thinking, like, oh, okay, like, you know, I can get my guy to regionals in the steeple or 5K or, you know, nationals, probably the 10K instead of the 5K. Right. And it's just all, I mean, I know I've been guilty of it, too. I mean, like, two years ago, we had a DMR team that uh, missed it by about a second and a half. And we had our mile of leg was Brian, who's a 5K, 10K guy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, indoors, you're running the DMR mile leg. Yeah. And then three and a half, you know, four weeks later, you're going to try a 10K at Stanford. Right. And it's just like, <laughs> what the hell yeah. are we doing? But yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah. you know, it's like, we have to get a DMR. Like, we have a shot. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. you got to go. And it's like, all right, like, let's try it. And I think it's, that's the point is like, you, you don't get this developmental side. Like, post collegiately, you sit down with Adley, you're like, where do we want to go? You know, yeah. how are we going to get there? Where's our vision? Like, you need to do this on the track, and then we're going to move you to this on the road or whatever. And, like, and then NCAA system, I feel like it's a lot of times, even with really good coaches, mm-hmm. it's this, like, right, well, now you fit here, so we got to do this, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. Well, even its job security, too, isn't what it was, you know, 10, 15 years oh, yeah. ago. It's reactive in that. You could have done an awesome job as an assistant or even as a head coach and, like, your AD leaves or your boss leaves, your head coach leaves for whatever reason. And then it's like, hey, you're SOL because I'm bringing in, this other person's not bringing in their people. And so you kind of have to be short-term now. Yeah. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to be at this school for, like, 20 years. 
I'm gonna build this thing up right, and we're gonna be known as this powerhouse of middle distance running, or powerhouse of steeplechase, or cross country. I mean, the Wetmores and like Rob Connors and Pat Tracy's of the world are a dying breed. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, and you can see it with so many people, like, who, oh man, I want a, a you know, cross country title, team title here at this school, and now I got this opportunity to go be the head coach of that school. Okay, guys, that was great. I'm out. <laughs> it's like, whoa, 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 time out, jeans. You know, and so I think that has a little bit of influence on the collegiate system as well, you know, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and then kind of coming, zooming in a little bit, I think from this training standpoint, I mean, we talked about this a little off, but it's because it's so reactive, right. you just get set. Yeah. You just get yeah. stuck. Yeah, and you look back at the body of work and you just think, like, come on, we're better than this. We're yep. better than this. Like, this is, we're, you know, we're, 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 as, we're as far along as, you know, we've ever been with this stuff. And and you look at it and you're like, really? This is what we got? This is it? It's like, you know, I'm running a seven-day schedule and we work out once or twice and we, you know, I mean, and, and, and I'm at these meets and you talk to people and it's like, everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone's doing the same thing. You went to the weight room twice, cool. You did drills no, twice, cool. You did what, long run once. You did workout. Yeah. Like, cool, all right. I mean, that's it. And it's it's all formulaic. Yeah. It's absolutely. just like, here's the formula because we all have the same constraints of like, oh, I got this right. Friday, this Saturday race. And you're like, you're just sitting there thinking like, oh, schedule. And then it's like, oh, but we have this race this right. week. And probably to, to break through that and, and, and like to break the box and, and, and push innovation, it means, you know, yeah, taking risk. And then you come back to like, are we in positions to take risk? Right, right. right. Yeah. Well, because it, it's, it's the system so like marks driven now. Like you have to be in a position to like throw down a fat mark pretty much any time you race because you're only going to race to like throw down a mark to get you either qualified to conference qualified to regionals or if you're indoor qualified to nationals and the same thing with cross it's like when you're going to throw down you strategically throw down at these big invites to improve your point total should something happen at the regional cross and so it's the constraints of the system as it is set up that has also dictated how people train and race as well because you can't have any more hey we're going to go run the dual meet you know, against Villanova, and we're just going to try in the 800 and the 4x4 as a 1500 meter runner, get you some speed on your belt, but just get right. you some exposure. Like, when do you ever go to a meet and say, "All right, dude, we're going to we're going to as a middle distance person, we're going to do that"? It's like blasphemy no, because I think it's exposure yeah. too. It's like back in the day, like the pre-internet day, like you could go run these dual meets, like no one freaking cares. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. like I'm running the you know, 3K and 800 or whatever it is. Like, no one cares. You win, you lose. No one might see it for yeah. a month. No one yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now it's like you wear your Tifers like profile as like the badge of honor. Like, yeah. I've I haven't lost. Yeah. You know, and it's like you know people freak out. Like as you said, like Cesarek, like oh he got out kicked. Like this is the end of the world for him. And I think that mentality, like prevents innovation too because kids expect to go into every race like up oh, like i'm gonna pr or win or feel great and all that stuff and as a coach like it, it restricts like you from getting off that seven day schedule because like if you push it a little bit and they feel they feel a little off then it's like oh my god i lost a race my world is over like my profile now has like yeah. this next to it yeah. or this time it's like oh yeah I think I think the way the, the the young athletes end up feeling about when you're restrained and you know they become dependent on routine right because we operate so much in routine that you know really innovation to me should be the freedom to break from routine the freedom to break from what's normal and you know we, we talked about Tuesday Friday workouts that's when you you know, you have kids believing, like, I've got to work out on Tuesday. Why? Because it's Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah but why? It's, we work out on Tuesdays. Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Ch you know. Church of the Sunday long run. Yeah. It's just, it's, right. yeah. It's, uh, and, and I think, you know, in our sport, we've got great examples of, um, yeah, you know, whether it's, whether the barrier was language or the barrier was culture or the barrier was just, you know, pre-internet access to information, we have great examples of people that in isolation – did stuff totally different, you yeah. know? Like, I mean, I remember working in, in Flagstaff with Japanese distance runners and, you know, you get young, developing females and they go out in the morning, come back to the hotel. Like, what'd you do? Ran 90 minutes. It was like, 
They didn't even think that was a long run. They just thought that's what you do in the morning. <laughs> yeah, we just run 90 minutes every morning. And I'm like, I would never do that <laughs> yeah. in a million years. Yeah. Like, why are you doing that? And they oh didn't, my God, you're going to be so fatigued. <laughs> and they were just like, no, it's just it's just a morning run. That's what you do. And they just didn't know. And, yeah. and, and you know, it's, it's like, so in isolation, you know, we, isolation to, in some ways to me almost, almost, you know, it, it can breed innovation. So it, it, you know, I, I see, I see where we are as a, in the NCAA, and I, we've got access to each other and all these things, but I wonder in some ways does that hold us back? Yeah, well, it's it's a, it's a copycat system too, because right. it's like much safer for me to go like, hey, Mike, like, what are you doing? You're doing this? All right, man, I'm I'm doing that too. I feel good about myself. Right. You know, like I'm not going to screw this up. Right. Uh, versus like hearing, hey, Mike, you're doing this. Oh, John, you're doing something else. Like, right. uh oh, like. What am I supposed to do? Like, you know, it's it's that copycat system where it's like, we almost we almost reinforce each other because yeah. it's like, oh, these guys are all being successful, are all doing this program, right? Like, so this is the way it should be done. And right. if I get out of this, like, I don't know if I'm gonna be successful. Right. So at least like now I can point to like, you know, my guys are like, oh, don't worry, like Georgetown's doing this, Stanford's doing this, right. you know. Like and uh, okay, we're good. Well, at the end of the day, what it ends up doing is it impedes their, you know, capacity to be immediately highly competitive post collegiately. Like I get all these kids now on the post collegiate side. Like, oh, what'd you do? Okay, you did 300, 200, 100 repeats, and that, that was your speed workout. And you did, you know, three mile on track tempo runs or four mile on track tempo runs, and that was your aerobic stuff. And then your mileage was low, and you did hurdle drills. And it's like, did you hit the weight room? No. Did you do any plyos? No. Did you do like all these auxiliary things that actually have, you know, these athletic movements that have all this benefit? And they're like, okay, no. So that to me, that's low hanging fruit. And it's like, well, I'm gonna try to layer this in, try to help you with that. And then immediately the kid just gets breaks down yeah. because they just have not been developed from an athletic, you know, holistic standpoint. And then we gotta start from scratch. We gotta start from like square one. Like, hey, no running. For like three weeks, we're just gonna get you in the weight room and just have you move. Like, well, if I don't run, I won't get better. Well, you won't get better if you're not strong and if you're not athletic. And I think, and everyone's like, well, I don't want to innovate with the weight room or any of these plyos or any of these strength and conditioning stuff because then that compromises the skill-specific activity of running and controlling the metabolism. And distance coaches, we know metabolism. We know how to manipulate metabolism with sets, reps, intensities, and lengths of things. But beyond that, we are, we're, you know, as a general like body where you know not, I'm not gonna say clueless but we are getting a clue more so but we're still pretty infantile in our understanding. Well I think it comes back to like in the NCAA system again you're so reactive. Like I know this like with my my athletes it's like you get them in the weight room and they, they get sore, right? Yeah. And, and they then, freak out. And then they freak out because you're like, but but I've got a race this week or next week. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't I can't be sore. Yeah. Like, and then it creates this, like, where you're always trying to combat that stuff because you don't have that period of time where it's like, all right, like, doesn't matter too much how you feel. Like, we're just trying to develop and all that stuff yeah. because it's always something going on. Right. And when you have that block of time, it's beautiful. I mean, I had this guy who joined from a, like, Power 5 school, and he's like, comes with all these limitations. He's a miler. He's like, oh, I ran fast. I ran, like, 339, but I can't do hills i can't do speed i can't do this because my achilles my calf blows up i said okay hey, time out we're gonna spend like two months just getting you you know strong yeah. and solid and right and then after that two month period from september to october we're hitting the track running like hundreds at you know 10 9 you know flying hundreds 10 9 11 1 he's doing hill repeats stairs with zero injury yeah. zero soreness and just you know it's like, man, we're getting good. We love it because now there's no limitations on anything we can do. And that's a lot of times I get that with a kid who comes out post collegiate and from great programs. They they have these perceived limits where it's like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I only can do things on certain days or else the whole like thing gets blown up and then I won't be good. It's because it's I think, and I don't know if you agree, Mike, but it's like you get in this mentality in college where it's managing. Like... You've got this person who might have this banged up thing, and you're like, God, but we have to get to the NCAA. Like, you got to make it through the NCAA meet. 
So we're just going to manage this. Yeah. And you just get in this system where it's like, all right, I got to manage this crisis, put out this fire, like hold everything together, you know, to get to this thing. And it's yeah. like, you just miss out on that. Like, wait, wait a minute. Like we need time and space yeah. to like, or it's like someone's done. banged up and it's like, it's the conference meet and you need the points. Like I've had yeah. athletes whose coaches sat them down and said, Oh, you have a, your, your foot is broken. You have yeah. a broken bone in your foot and you're going to, you have to run this race tomorrow because yeah. you with a broken foot will still be point scorer yeah. versus we won't get those points if you don't run with a broken foot. And it's like, wait, 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 time out. What? And like, yeah. no, <laughs> it makes no sense. Like if I have someone who's like busted, it's like, all right, great. Season's done. Shut yeah. it down. Like, yeah. I don't need you to run at the Olympic trials or the U.S. championship to make me look better. I need you to be yeah. fit and healthy and ready to go. Well, but one of the one of the you know foundational pieces of adaptation is to you know we're, we're talking about breaking down the body to build it back stronger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This, this, this is a, a you know there's what we're doing. We're assigning a stress so the body has a reaction to a stress every single day. When I know as a college coach, I get a kid on a Wednesday that's like, Coach, I'm tired. And I'm like. Shit, we got a race this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. But actually, no, wait a second. I'm, I'm purposely inserting tired. Yeah. Tired is what we're looking for, right? Tired is tired's okay, right? Tired, I mean, you know, to, to a point. I mean, all yeah. those things. Like, and even soreness, right? Soreness is, I'm, you know, I'm sore. My body is going to create an adaptation to sore. I'm going to be eventually yeah. not sore, right? And <laughs> mm-hmm. So, if, you know, psychologically, as the coach, if I'm having a reaction to tired, if I'm having a reaction to sore, you know, and, and you keep responding to that based on the system we're in or the calendar that we're in, you know, in some ways we stay stagnant in our growth. Yeah. And the weird thing too in your guys' system or the NSA system, the most critical time when you can, you know, develop someone, you have to be hands off. Like the summer, yeah. you have to be hands off. You can't be like, Hey guys, it's cross country. You're gonna do the first half of the season by yourself. Like here here here's my suggestions for you guys to do because <laughs> I can't tell you exactly what to do, but right. here's a general suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. And hope you guys show up in shape. Or then like after cross, like for winter break. It's another month where it's like, hey, hands off. Like, all right, just hopefully you guys develop without my watch fly. And so you don't get to develop them when they need it most. And exactly that, you're just managing these people so they feel good all the time, so then they feel confident, so they can do what they naturally do, which is run very fast and express that quality because they're very talented. And you see it, it's it's not anyone's fault. Every coach has to default to that because it's the system. You have to be ready to go at these things because that's what your administration prioritizes. That's what your boss prioritizes. And if you want more scholarship dollars, if you want to go in and say, hey, can I get another you know, full ride for the program from your AD or can I get you know, another full ride for this event group from your, your head coach as a boss, like, you've got to be able to justify it to them. Otherwise, you're going to be like, no, nope, no reason. Like, do with what you got. But it's like, we're going to go, we're going to fall behind in like two, three years and you're sitting here pulling your hair out. So, it's like you almost have to act some in some ways you have to offer the athletes up on a sacrificial platter <laughs> to, to like be able to down the road uh, yeah be able to then do it the right way right. Yeah. but in two to three years who knows if you're gonna still be at coaching at that place <laughs> so true. So true. Like, like that's why I'm never going back come back <laughs> come back John. I, but and, but yet you hear like say in you know, USA track and field, like they propagate this system as the best developmental system in the entire world. And they, I talked to a lot of agents or international coaches and they just think like, it's it's batshit crazy. You know, they're like, well, no, just like sign them young, coach them when they're 18, you know, or 19, and just have us stick with the same coach, same program for like the next 10 years and take a long-term developmental approach you know, just invest in them early as a young stock and do that. And I think, you know, that's maybe one of the reasons why all these kids are going pro so soon because they get to control the strings a little bit more versus being, you know, marionettes and puppets for someone else to like move and shake. <laughs> oh boy. Like. So, I mean, for me also too, so like, Let's ask this, like you guys are always asking questions. What's the most innovative thing you've implemented in your team's training in the last year? That you felt like, man, this is something new, this is something exciting. And then did it work? <laughs> and how do you like qualify if it worked? Oh man. Yeah. 
<laughs> See, this is an issue. You should like that should be top that, of mind, right? What? I've got too many too many athletes. Um, I'm in post collegiate world. Um, oh yeah, co- get back to college co- system. Co- college yeah. system when world. Have you been playing the college system or, or your, You know, your I'll put it this way. Uh, almost all my innovations in the college system have happened because athletes didn't fit the mold of being able to handle the stuff. I give you an example this year. Like, we had a girl who ran relatively fast. I mean, not, not fast, but she was a freshman who ran two days a week, and that's it. And she ran, I don't remember, like mid-430s for 1500 as a freshman girl for us. But she ran it doing two days a week and, like, 10 miles a week, right? right. Right. And I was like, but that was the only way, like, we could keep her healthy. So I was like, all right, we'll do this thing. Same thing, I had an 800 guy, uh, very similar, who came in, banged up, beat up to hell. And, like, every time we trained, like, he would just, like, go into this valley of death. Right. So I was like, uh, like, go get in the pool for a while. Like, we'll get our aerobic stuff there. And then we'll, at first, we were like... We're just going to do hundreds back and forth, like, and this is it. So, you know, I think almost all, like, the innovations from a college standpoint I've had has been, like, this reaction to, like, crap. Yeah. You don't, like, you don't fit this normal mold. Right. Like, you're breaking down even on, like, this very reduced level. I've got to figure out, like, all right, how do we kind of maximize this? to make it where you can like get on the track and be healthy but again there it's a reaction like it's true it's a reaction to like well you know this isn't working so we got to try some other shit right and you know versus if i looked at like the post-collegiate world like if i have an athlete who comes in who has some like like Tasha coming in had some weird restrictions and stuff. It was very like proactive. Right. It was like, all right, like this, this, and this like hasn't worked in the past. Like this has. Like I know where your mindset is, but somehow we have to get here. So like, let's figure out the best program for you to get to this point. Right. Where on the college side, it's like my innovation has almost inevitably been like, oh shit, like, <laughs> like we got to do something different. Yeah. Like, it's like, not that like planned proactive. It's just like a reactive thing. Yeah. The innovation, the innovation is there. The reason for the, the innovation. innovation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I would say the same thing. I mean, my, you know, my, what I would call my innovation, a lot of it is responding to the dilemma of the calendar, the dilemma yeah, of, you know, I'm going to try to get someone to the NCAA meet indoors and outdoors. Okay, well, to do that, and that doesn't seem absurd. An 800-meter runner yeah. Yeah. didn't emphasize cross-country. doesn't seem that crazy. We're going to try to get you to the meet in March and try to get you to the yeah. meet in June. Okay, March and June, that doesn't even seem that crazy. But now let's break it down, what, what it takes to do that. Okay, so you got to run the time, you know, call that January or February to run the meet in March. And then you got to run the regional meet in May. So you got to run the time for the regional meet you know, in April or May, yep. and then you got to run the meeting. So next thing you know is, I mean, I just went, I, I came up with something for January, February, March, April, May, June. And so, uh, yeah, I guess the, the thought process behind it is, um, you know, for me it was trying to get them ready early, get the time that's going to get them to the meet, but then train for outdoors once we have the time. And I don't know. I don't know if we succeed or not. <laughs> but, it, I mean, those are the things you face with. Right, like, yeah. it's like, that's the problem, yeah. is that innovation just gets super restricted when you go through, like, that process. Because well, it's like, you don't have time. You don't have time. Like, right. You're just like, yeah. God, I have to have, we got to get the time here. This is the time, this is the only time we're going to, you know, Washington yeah. indoors or Stanford outdoors right. or whatever. Like, this is the time. Yeah. We have to get this so that we can be at this meet. And then restart. We have to get this so we can be at the regional meet. Right. <laughs> and then be ready to run a completely different type of race at the regional meet. Yeah. You know, to get to the national meet. In completely diff- different weather. And, completely and different, different, yeah. You know, and stresses. Exactly. And it's just, you know, you're preparing for so many different things. Yeah. And Absolutely. by the time you get done, like you're, as you said, you have four months out of the year that are dedicated to like these specific things which you have to hit. Yeah. Like, their requirements, mm-hmm. 
And then you add in the layer of if you're AD or head coach or whatever is like, oh, we have to score this many points at conference. Now it's like, all right, in addition to qualifying for the regional meet, getting to the national meet, we have to run like these rounds at the conference meet and you're going to have to double and do this because we need you to get more points. Yeah. And it just becomes as like, well, okay, now we have to be rested and ready to do this. Right. You know, what's amazing is some of the people that break these rules and break these norms, and it's usually on accident, right? So it's an athlete that got sick or injured yeah. and got thrown off schedule. Yeah. I mean, in cross country, shoot, each of my each of my years at Georgetown in cross country, we had someone at their best in November that was like hurt in August or September, right? Yeah. And what was it is they kind of broke this. So... All my, like what I consider my, you know, experience or my intelligence or any of these things that I call like my like traits, I couldn't come up with a better, <laughs> my <laughs> July to November yeah. training scheme wasn't as good as like, shit, everyone should just get hurt in, in August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone should just get injured, you'll be great. I mean, I can't come up, yeah. I mean, those people were better than the people that I, as hard as I tried yep. to be, make you good in, in November, you know, the girl with the, you know. Stress reaction in September end up the number one runner. I, I don't know why. I can't say why. So no, it was it. The same thing happened to me this cross country. Our our guy who ended up our second guy at conference. who was top ten at conference. He ran his first race at like the Texas A and M invite, so not super hard, and he yeah. was like ninety fifth, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and he was coming off. He had like a bout of like. Well, he had some Achilles pain, then like a bout of insomnia, so he just didn't train for a while. Yeah. And it's just like at the conference meet, like everyone else who was cranking was like, was like uh, hanging on, you know, and it's like this guy just kind of comes, comes bouncing along and you're just like, well, this is great, but, you know, <laughs> so much for my brilliant planning there. Right. <laughs> like, right. that's out the window. All like, that planning, yeah. All it, that and, and, but you see that. You see that all the time, you know. We were talking the other day. It's like Charles Jock makes yeah. the eight on your team, hasn't run well, like hasn't run well all season. Was coming off injury, but man, he looked fresh and yeah. bouncy and That's like. That's the thing people don't know. He was he did he did not start pretty much every race he was yeah. scheduled to run in June because he had this hamstring issue, and they had to back off. And yet here he comes, looking fresh as a daisy down the home straightaway and just getting it done. And it's like, you know. I always, and I look at that too, like even like my own athlete, like Tara Welling, like before she won the U.S. Half Marathon Champs, probably like the quote unquote worst month of training possible. Like yeah. didn't complete workouts, just wasn't feeling good. Like my head stayed good, weightlifting stayed good, like she stayed running. But in terms of like what I would consider the things to get her prepped and ready to go, it did not happen. And it, didn't, and it was just like managing her confidence saying, hey, you look, you really fit. Just go in there and compete. I did not, could not have, like, if you would have paid me a thousand dollars, I guess the time would not have said it would have been like the 70 25 she ran and winning. Like, it was like, I was ready to pick up the pieces, like, all right, 77 minute half marathon, hey, yeah, you're great, don't worry, just we'll be okay. And it's like, boom, she goes out and gets it done. And I think it, it shows you how important, you know, managing the, the complete picture is rather than just, we get too cute and trying to isolate certain systems here and there. When I hear like athletes or coaches talk about, well, this is geared towards that system and this system and that system and it's like man it's it's an ecosystem one thing affects yeah, something everything, else everything. we can't just have a say well today is all cns work it's like no you're gonna hit some aerobic you're gonna hit yeah. everything like you're gonna get it done and to and that to, to have that misaligned understanding i think it it, it gets us too cute and it, then we start to overcoach it, it, overcoaching is a big deal and i know we're going all over the place with this but it's like the thing I see is it's not like it's just our experience, right? Where you have that injured athlete or that athlete who's banged up and then all of a sudden like they come along and kill it. Like you see that all the time. All the time. And I think as coaches, like that should we we never fully appreciate that and we never like step back and ask the question of like, Alright, this athlete like really killed it and they didn't have like all these check boxes of like the program that we had instilled like why why and how did this happen it's right. not like i think sometimes it's easy to be like oh that athlete's just talented like that was a fluke yeah but i think there's a reason that like you know these mm -hmm. things happen where you have these athletes who just fresh as a daisy mm -hmm. kills it they can yeah. express their talent right. and that 
perfect plan that we had for some other athletes, like, didn't show. It just didn't work. Yeah. yeah. It just didn't work. No, it's, that, that, that will always be... That, that to me is a mystery. It'll always be a mystery, but maybe it doesn't have to be as much of a mystery. Yeah. Maybe there, there's as much learning that can occur there as, you know, when the when the when it does go as planned. Yeah. You know, but we have to ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you guys, I mean, the whole workout Wednesday phenomena that happens now, how much has that helped versus hurt? Because in my opinion, you know, I'll put my cards out right now, I think it's hurt because it gives these kids, like, oh, man, NAU's doing this, Stanford's doing this, Oregon's doing that. Like, coach, we need to be on this level doing those type of workouts because that's going to correlate to us being successful and running fast. And if we're not doing things close to that work level or workloads, we're not as good. And it's like the athletes now are getting too smart. And it's it, unfortunately, I always tell people it's it's not a direct correlation. What you do in workout is not directly correlated Correlate, to how you yeah. perform. Right. And what you're trying to express is you're trying to express your capacity in a race yeah. given the circumstances of that race. And a Stanford 10K perfect conditions much different than an Austin regional qualifying 10k you know where it's hot and humid and thunderstormy but yet you go in thinking oh man if I haven't done a certain prescriptions of sets yeah. reps and paces I have no shot because I know what they've been doing and then it just becomes this whole like you know uh, chess game of egos and confidence and how do you guys you know I always had trouble with that how do you manage <laughs> them to like be turn off the you know um, I, the, the, the the filter and just like focus on what we're doing and just have confidence in what you're doing instead of being like well it's not as good as what they're doing it's like dude it's not keeping up with the Joneses here because in my opinion every athlete's an N01 at the end of the sure. day but it's difficult to you know express that I think that access to access yeah. to information yeah. is um, yeah. to me that's the question I, I'm, I'm fascinated by is, is innovation and is this type of thinking? Is it? Is it? Does it? Do we flourish in isolation or with collaboration? And it seems like the answer should be collaboration, right? Like, hey, we're we're going to be more creative if we bounce ideas off each other. But instead, I think, I mean, how many how many problems arise from, you know, hey, I got a week at Donovan Brazier's training. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Three, yeah. Three, man. Yeah. What are yeah. you doing with your eight hundred? Right? Uh -huh. right? Or like you mentioned, yeah. workout Wednesdays. Or how many? I mean, how many yeah. flaws are made with yeah. it's like, you know. Hey, um, how to you know? How does Ryan Hall train or whoever? You know, it was all these all these people that we took these outliers and we we you know they became the rule how to yeah. how to do something. And, and instead of making decisions based on like you said the you know example of this one organism in front of me. Yeah, you know, I think it's funny. I think you, I I think we can turn to business for the answers. Like everyone thinks like, oh, if I get this group this collaborative stuff like everything's good we're gonna just throw ideas off and like we have this idealized version of it but if you look at research like that doesn't happen right like what happens is everyone like oh we all conform like right. we all right. have group yeah. think like oh you do this yeah 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 that's next it. thing you know we're all yeah. doing the same thing. we're all doing the right. same thing right. but like when you're isolated i think sometimes it's like you don't have those outside perspectives like right. you don't have those other people influencing you and it's just you and you're just thinking like, all right, like I'm gonna try this stuff and like. Yeah, I mean, it's, you almost ask the question in training, pre-internet, were we more creative? Yeah. Right, were, was there some, some dude out in Norway uh -huh. right in the intervals, totally? I, and I think, I think to a degree we were. Yeah. I think, cause if you look at, like if you look at now, like everyone does the same thing. Right. Like there's, there's subtle variations, you know, mileage, workouts, all that stuff, but the pattern is very similar. Right. If you look, you know, years ago, it's like, you know, you got, you got Percy Sarity being like, you know, let's try and run up this shit and like do some lifting afterwards, yeah. you know, yeah. or it's like Igloy's like, Igloid. you know, Igloid, like, yeah. Hey, I got a track. We're going to be on the track all the time, but like, I'm going to figure out how to get like aerobic benefits from this, like sprint benefits. We're just gonna right. be all over the place. And right. I think like sometimes that's like, they were just like guys figuring it out. Yeah, exactly. They were they were figuring out what they were taking. Here, here's what I got in front of me. I got a sand dune. Yeah, it's 213 <laughs> meters. Yeah. It's not 200. It's two, I don't know why we're doing 213. That's how far the sand is. Right. right. I got you know, or I got this track right. You're right, but I mean, in some ways, that's more creative right. to me than how does so and so train? Oh, oh yeah. this is what they're doing this on flow track. They did this, or, you know, or whatever. Well, it's like Lydia too. It's like he's like, I'm gonna bound up some hills. Like this is great. And I think, like, now it's, like, if you deviate at all, you're, like, oh, God, like, yeah, you know, this is, like, I'm, I'm out here, 
Like, this isn't have this comfort zone of, like, you know, you and I are doing the similar stuff, so I feel good about so it. So I guess my question is then, in those examples, Igloy, whoever, Surrey, what 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 environment what what factors were in place to promote that type of thinking to promote like looking around being like okay i got like you know i got two dumbbells here i got one sand dune i got that like what promoted that right it was it was to me is isolation yeah right? it was or, or language barriers right or like if i can't like you, you you know you mentioned someone um earlier today what were you talking about went over couldn't communicate with the Kenyans and Ethiopians. Yeah. Oh, web. Right. Couldn't web. so right. Yeah. So he had no idea that yeah. everyone's doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, he's like, man, I'm working harder than anybody right now. Yes. Right? So language, geography, pre-internet, that promoted this kind of. You know, well, you had innovation. to figure it out. You had to figure it out. Like so, the, I think the the past is like the good coaches, like had to figure stuff out. Figure it out. They had to be like, all right, it's like, yeah. I'm gonna try this on you. Because I think it might work, but I don't know. But I don't know what all these other guys over here are doing, so we're going to try this. Yeah. And it's like, if it doesn't work, all right, scratch that, gone, on to the next idea. Yeah. So yeah. our challenge now yeah. is, can we, can, you know, can we look at it that same way, except now we, got, we know what everyone else That's is doing. doing, everyone's watching what we're doing, if we make mistakes, hey. everyone's going to know about it today. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, can we still think like that? Yeah. That's it's the tough. question. That's the challenge. It's the tough. Like, going back to Sarity, like, he had some crazy, like, if you look at his ideas on, like, running for him, oh, like, yeah. he had some yeah. crazy-ass ideas <laughs> yeah. that obviously didn't work. But he had the flexibility to be like, let's try this crazy shit. This didn't work. But the overall plan of everything else worked. Yeah. And I think that's, like, as coaches, like, you know, 80% of the stuff we do works. Yeah. But there's 20% of it or so that's, like, God knows. Like, I don't know. Yeah. You don't know, like no one knows. Yeah. But that's the thing. Everyone pretends or wants like, to know, and you're handcuffed by yeah. this illusion of knowing. Like, how many times have you sat down with a recruit or a kid and like, well, what's your training philosophy? What does a typical yeah. seven day, you know, week look like yeah. for me? If you're training me, how are you going to get me yeah. from a four oh eight mile guy yeah. to a three fifty eight mile guy in two years? And you're like, <laughs> like, dude, it's not that cut and dry. But we've made it seem like it's a, you know, it's an input equation. X, Y, Z in, X, Y, you know, A, B, C out, and you're magically going to get there. So I, I think as coaches, like, our challenge is, like, I call it we get stuck in, like, default mode workouts, mm-hmm. right? Where you're writing workouts and you're, like, thinking about it, but you're, like, instantly drawn to, like, all right, in this situation I do this because I've always done this and this has worked to a degree. I think it's, like, forcing ourselves out of that situation. And it's, like, I think nowadays, like, because everything points us towards this group think like we have to create like our own constraints and limitations and force them upon ourselves to say no like all right what if i can only do this like what if i'm constrained how would i get this workout done if i have you know a grass field and this is it like how am i going to get this adaptation done and I think those are the points where, like, we have to just force ourselves to get innovative because it's, like, unless we do that, we're always going to default to, like, oh, we need some aerobic development, so we're going to go out on this loop and we're going to do our, you know, 30-minute threshold run because this is what we do and this is how we're going to do it. Right. And, and the risk is that your confidence becomes dependent on yep. those things. Whereas can you be... Can you be this that confident in on a grass field? Can you yeah. be that confident without a watch? watch. Can you right. be that confident? Right? Could we? I mean, could we still be that confident? Could we instill that confidence on our athletes? And that's that's the issue. Yeah. Like it's, you know, and you know, John and I were talking about this earlier. Is we get a lot of post collegiate athletes who are broken down and on the rebound, and like, it's great because those are the chances we have to innovate, and like those are almost if you look at like the crazy stuff I do. It's almost always with those athletes. You know, I've talked about her a lot, but first two months of training Natasha Rogers, she would not wear a watch. So, like, she was just like, I'm not wearing a watch, you know? And in my head, I'm like, all right, well, there goes this plan. You you know? (laughs) Like, but, like, in that situation, like, it forced me to, like, if I didn't, if she didn't say I'm not wearing a watch, I'm going with our traditional program, you know? But because she's like, I'm not wearing watch. It's like, oh shit! Like Dude. time, time to actually think here. Right. And I think like those situations, like it's entirely risky, and you don't like you asked me at that time. I'm like, I don't know if this worked. But it's those situations where sometimes we just have to take that risk and be like, 
you know, put those constraints on ourselves to be like, all right, this is different. We got to try this. It might not work. But like, if I'm going to progress and get better as a coach and not just get stuck in this, like, well, you know, this is how I'm always done right. this. But it takes a special coach and a special athlete or group of athletes to buy into that. Cause most people, they want the prescription. They just yeah. want, Hey, you know, like with gags, right? Gags is like Monday we do this, Wednesday we do this, Wednesday we do this, Wednesday we do this Saturday, we, Saturday we do that, and that's how it is. And it's safe, and it's welcoming, and it's you know, routine, and you can depend on it. Versus if you're thinking, well, hey, we're gonna teach you as an N one, we're gonna, you know, really, all right, we're gonna go on a ten day cycle, seven day cycle, eighteen day cycle. You know, like people want to have that plan because it gives them that confidence yep. that they're gonna expect this return on their investment of time, effort, and energy. You just don't want to be, like I was telling, you know, one worker is like, dude, I'm kind of like a mad hatter. Like, I, we have a plan, but we'll probably only follow 80% of the plan because I'm always watching what you're doing in the moment. And I'm trying to get a, maximize the adaptation with minimizing the critical breakdown from you from session to session. And every session is dependent on each other because the ecosystem you have your track sessions, you have your gym sessions, you have your aerobic off-track sessions, you have your mileage impact, you have how you're just dealing in life. Did you sleep fully or not? Yeah. You know, did you break up with the boyfriend, get a new boyfriend? Like, those things matter, man. Like, did someone in your family die? Are you all distraught? Like, are you not living well or righteous? Like, those things are important, but yet we only take the superficial, like, just do these workouts and this volume, and you magically, it's like a magic wall, you're gonna get good. How do I define like the most innovative coaches are the teams and people where it's like, those people come in and they're not highly talented or highly recruited and just okay, solid distance runners at whatever level, high school or collegiate, and then that coach and that athlete or that group dynamic elevates them to a whole nother platform. But yet, we don't really champion that, we only champion, man, what Clay and Murphy do? You know, man, what's Edward Cheswick doing? Like, what, what's the top dogs doing? Because it's that, you know, that idea of I do what everyone, what the people at the highest critical mass yeah. are doing, I'm going to get this trickle-down effect because they're doing something really innovative. I go, no, man, Edward Cheswick has been good forever. <laughs> that, it, we, like, say, we say this all the time. Like, the really good athletes, like, they're going to be good, like, Sarah Hall was good before I coached her. Yes. She'll be good with whoever coaches yes. her after. Like, yes. the really good athletes are just really good. They're really good. That's the one constant. The one constant is yeah. not who's coaching them or what workouts they're doing. It's just you're extraordinarily talented. Yeah. And it's just being in a position to express that talent and then cultivate that talent, get that talent and capacity a little bit better. You know, and that... I think we, we lose sight of that as well. You know, it, we, we want it to be this ego, like, oh man, I know this secret sauce, got this magic formula, but it's not. It really comes down to knowing what you have in front of you and knowing how to, you know, manipulate or not manipulate, you know, physical attributes accordingly to the system that you're in, whether it's a collegiate system, high school system, or post collegiate system. Yeah, I think as we began this, you know, identifying, you know, what, what's challenging about the collegiate system, you know, this very subject becomes more, I mean, it, harder and harder, constrained by calendar, constrained by, you know, all, all these pieces we find, like, super, super challenging. It is. So it, it, is. Put, it puts it on us, you know, but that's the challenge for it, us is to it, work through that. It's all about, you know, coaches, you have to get out of that, that like, right. default mode. Right. It's like, we're, we have all these constraints, calendar, as you said, all this racing, all this stuff, but it's like, it's on us to not settle. Not settle. You know, and I think that's like the number one thing that we have to fight as coaches is like don't get trapped into this stuff. Know that some stuff we do is gonna fail, and we're gonna look like idiots, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. But you're it's, gonna get people hurt, yeah. you know. It's, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. So we've been talking for about an hour, so we'll we'll wrap this one up. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. Thank you. Oh, we appreciate great. I've been a fan of this podcast. I want y'all to know. I appreciate right. it. Appreciate Sitting it. in DC traffic. <laughs> Easy. Throw this on. Listen to you two. Wow. The sweet so sounds. Yeah. Thank God someone's listening. <laughs>